All right, we're back and we're in the book of Acts in the 16th chapter. This is a fairly lengthy chapter uh, and uh, we'll take a little bit uh, of uh, maybe a little bit more time on this one than we have on some of the others, but uh, it's history too. Remember that what we're reading is history and actually as we get on, uh, on in the, our study of the book of Acts, we find the passages to be much more historical and narrative that is telling a story of what's going on as opposed to focusing in on the various doctrines of the church and the, the doctrines of, of the early church and the apostles. So we're going to, we've got uh, 40 verses or so, and uh, coming through this, uh, we're going to be looking at some history. So let's begin. We're going to begin reading shortly, but in, I'm on page 197 in our notebook, and I like to give an introduction to each uh, segment that we do here. So let's just, just read through the first uh, paragraph there. 16 records some important episodes in the life and travels of Paul. After separating from Barnabas, as we spoke of in our last uh, session, after separating, because of the dispute over John Mark, Paul and Silas begin the second of three missionary journeys. The chapter begins and ends in what appears to be a relatively harmless manner. Yet in between, Paul's life and freedom uh, hang in the balance. So if you just read verses 1 and verses 4, you say there's not a whole lot going on, but read the 38 verses in between, and there is. What I see here and what the main uh, focal point is, is the obedience and purposefulness of Paul the Apostle, the constancy and faithfulness of God. I'm also reminded that the gospel casts a very wide net and the simplicity of the message of the gospel. Uh, chapter 16, what must I do to be saved? We read that later on in the chapter and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Sounds simple. Remember this, though. There isn't any one passage of Scripture in the book of Acts that gives us a complete um, accounting of all of the things that a person must believe to trust Christ as Savior. So we really have to go through the whole book and accumulate what are the essentials of the Christian message. What are the essentials of the gospel message? And we did that in a lesson, maybe three, four lessons ago, when I um, uh, spoke on the subject of what must I believe to believe. You may remember that. And we listed things that we believe are uh, the essentials of the Christian message. So consequently, again, we don't see those um, essentials, each component, in, uh, in every account of a person coming to Christ as Savior. So we see here on page 197, we've got again, just by way of review, uh, chapters 13 uh, through 28, and uh, an outline of Paul's second of three, second of three missionary journeys, first with Barnabas, this one now with Silas. And you can see this covers a gr much greater distance than the first missionary journey, a much greater amount of time, and you can see that he went to many more places on this journey than he did on his first. So we're looking here at an outline of, of 16 at the top of page 198. We're going to see the circumcision of Timothy, what many call the Macedonian call, three conversion experiences, Lydia, a young woman, and the magistrates incar incarcerate Paul, and then the conversion, la lastly, of the jailer that I referred to moments ago. So let's look at the circumcision of Timothy. Let's read, picking up our reading in chapter 16, verse number 1. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, a, certain, a son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. So he was Jewish and Gentile. He was, a, uh, he was half and half. 
which was well reported of by the brethren, he had a good reputation, which were at Lystra in Iconium. Him would Paul have, go, have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. Paul did not want to be a stumbling block to the Jews. He knew that there were Jews out there that would call Timothy into question and Paul's um, message into question would call Paul, possibly call Paul a hypocrite because Timothy, who was half Jewish, was not circumcised. So rather than be a stumbling block, that was taken care of immediately so that wouldn't be a problem later on in their ministry. Him would Paul have have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all for they knew all that his father was a Greek and as they went through the cities they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily so again we've uh, made mention of this some time ago and again we will hear the church is on a roll good things are happening people are coming to Christ there's opposition, there's obstacles that have to be overcome, time, travel, all of those things, certainly monetary costs along the way. Not everybody happy, but many, maybe many more people happy with what is taking place. So what they were doing was they're traveling and they're establishing churches in the faith. This is discipleship, discipleship. Paul went to churches uh, for the first time he would go uh, to any church he ever went to. Obviously, he went the first time. But then he would make a return visit to them to confirm them or establish them, make sure that they were moving forward. And if they weren't, he would spend some time with them, answering their questions and giving them further instruction in their faith. So 16, 1 through 3, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, Chapter 16 begins with what we know as the third missionary journey. This extends to the 22nd verse of chapter number 18. There's 21 approximately, by my count, different locations that he will uh, visit. Timothy, or Timotheus, is mentioned about 25 times in the New Testament. He is a uh, disciple, a convert of Paul the Apostle, the disciple of Paul the Apostle, and uh, the, two of the books in the New Testament were written to Timothy, First and Second Timothy. And of course, Timothy, through his discipleship, became a great leader in the early church himself. He was uh, the son of a Jewish, a Jewess, and his father uh, was a Greek. Timothy was half and half. His mother's name was Eunice, his grandmother's Lois, we find that in Second Timothy, his heritage presented an unusual in, uh, situation which invited criticism, as we mentioned. Had Timothy not been circumcised, the Jews would have assumed that he was renouncing his Jewish heritage, choosing to live as a Gentile. Paul required the circumcision for expediency's sake, to avoid placing an unnecessary stumbling block in the way of Jewish evangelism. Timothy's circumcision granted him full access to the synagogues he would visit with Paul and with Silas. So this was just a a residual benefit of this. Timothy was to play a key role in Paul's life, as we've already mentioned. Let's pick up the reading in verse number 6 of Acts 16. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed or they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately... We endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. 
Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is of the chief city of the, that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women, which resorted uh, thither, came to there, thither. So verse 6 tells us that Paul was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach. Paul had to be extremely sensitive to God's leadership in his life. And it was the Lord's will. He determined this. He doesn't go into detail here, much like God will show you and give you direction in certain things in life. Uh, he has never given me direction by an audible voice. Uh, he has given me direction through other leaders. He's given me direction through reading the Word of God. He's given me direction through the circumstances of life, and we could go on. So God does give us direction. He's also given us common sense, and He puts desires in our hearts, things like that. All of those things work together for a, attempting to determine what God's will is for us in our lives. So apparently all of these things or some of these things um, were brought into consideration by the Apostle Paul and he realized that he was not to go to Asia. It was the Lord's will that the gospel go west and in the direction of what we know as Europe today. So we've noted forbidden of the Holy Ghost, verse 6, the Spirit suffered them not, verse 7, and then the vision comes along, a vision that Paul had that gave him assurance not only of why he was forbidden to go east, but exactly what he was to do and why he was to go to the west. Verse 13, there was no church building per se. Christians were known to meet together uh, by the river, by the tree, by the town square, whatever you might call uh, my pastor today, Pastor Pesky, uh, started a church in uh, Zambia, Africa. The name of the church, and I believe it still exists today, was Big Tree Baptist Church. They did not have a building. There was a particular tree in that area where they lived that was well known by everybody as the Big Tree. So when they said, we're going to meet for, uh, on Sunday to have a worship service, all they had to do was pass the word, we will meet under the big tree or at the big tree at such and such a time. And of course, that's where people assemble. It's not unusual. The church isn't a building. The church is the people. We all know that. It certainly is convenient and comfortable for us who live in the Western world and live in the United States of America to have a warm, dry, comfortable church building that's dedicated for the services and the work of the ministry. It's wonderful to have that, but it's not necessary to preach the gospel. It's just kind of a, an add-on. It's a benefit for many of us. So, notice in verse 10 of, uh, uh, verse 10 of the text, it says, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we, you see the pronoun, plural, first person, plural pronoun, we. That's important. It's important because this is where we believe that Luke joins Paul's missionary team. All of a sudden, the writer of this becomes a we, not a they or a him or whatever. It's a we. This is what we are doing, and I think that's important. It's important because we know that uh, Luke uh, gained his information uh, firsthand from individuals who actually went through the experiences, but he also gained much of his information firsthand because he was an eyewitness to what was taking place. So we see these conversions. Chapter 16, verse 14, we read, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, notice again, she's baptized. We don't really see a plan of salvation here. 
we don't know exactly the form prayer or the prayer that she prayed or how she acknowledged the fact that Christ was her Savior. But we do know this. She worshiped God. Her heart was, was opened by the Lord. And she attended unto the things. In other words, she listened to what Paul said. We don't have a record of exactly what he said. But then she was baptized. So apparently, she came to faith in Christ. Not only her, verse 15, but her household. She besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us, or she compelled us. She said, Come, I want you to be, come to my house and spend some time there with us. And be an influence on me and my family. Um, so Lydia is the first recorded, if we can call this, European conversion. Now we know that uh, Cornelius was of the Italian band, so you could take exception to this statement here. Uh, obviously, if he was an Italian, Italy is in Europe. Rome, Italy is in Europe, so Cornelius was European by descent also. But Lydia was a seller of purple. Purple dye was prohibitively expensive. So this woman was a woman who was a woman of means. She, she had some money. She was wealthy. The selling of purple was a very lucrative business during this time. The mention of the city of Thyatira is one of the churches that are mentioned in the first, uh, um, within the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. And there's three things that stand out about her. Again, we don't have a plan of salvation, but we do know something about her. She was a worshiper, she listened, she was obedient, she was hospitable. Now we see a young woman, verse 16, and it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed, a damsel is a young woman, possessed with a spirit of divination, she's demonically influenced or possessed, met us, which brought her masters much gain, money, by soothsayings. People subscribed to this woman. and She had managers, agents, if you please. We might call them pimps today. She had people who would advertise her wares, her abilities as a soothsayer, and uh, they would get a cut, obviously, off the uh, uh, admission charges. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God. And that was true. They are. But coming from her, that didn't really give them any credibility because she was a demon-possessed individual. So what she said could easily be brought into question. So, it says, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul being grieved, we don't need this kind of advertising. We don't need her to help market what we are doing. He was grieved and turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So, um, this is the, the story of this young woman. She, is a, uh, she has a spirit of divination, verse 16 says. Uh, a soothsayer, uh, I noted in, under uh, 1616, she's a fortune teller. Uh, I see fortune tellers becoming even more popular, even in the town where I live. There's a couple places I know where uh, individuals advertise, you know, come in for a palm reading, tarot card reading, whatever it is, that's becoming more and more common in America today. People want their, uh, you know, they want their, their palm read or they want to look in the newspaper and see what their astrological charts say about what's going to happen to them today. Verse 17, these men are the servants of the ho Most High God. Whatever she said was true, but it was demonically motivated, probably to discredit them. It would be a great way to do that. Paul was grieved about this. And uh, uh, so were, in what, what uh, Paul did, cast the devil out of the woman. 
that created a problem for her managers, her agents who were making money off her because she lost her power and resulting in the loss of income. It goes on to affect uh, the business community in the town. And uh, uh, <laughs> people are just not happy with the loss of income. The economy is in depression because of what Paul has done. And they are accused of, quote, troubling the city, verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, she lost her demonic power and ability. They caught Paul and Silas. Of course, they blamed them for the, the uh, loss of income and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, the magistrates were the political authorities or officials, and certainly they were probably... Um, also uh, advantaged by uh, any, pro any economic production in the community, the government seems in some way to profit from. And the magistrates saw some of their profits maybe going down the drain also. So it says that, they, that Paul and Silas were brought to them and uh, saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Of course, we're not going into specifics here. Well, yes, we are. It's not that our funds are diminishing. They teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. So they're looking for a scapegoat, looking for some, something else to blame their grief or their displeasure on. Not the fact that this woman has lost her demonic power because Paul cast that demon or devil out of her. Well, anyway, picking it up in verse 22, and the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. So, these crimes mentioned in verse 21, it was a crime to teach, apparently, customs which are not lawful for us to receive or observe because we're Romans. They're telling us or they're putting constraints on us that are not legal. These people need to be incarcerated. Well, before they're incarcerated, they suffer some physical harm. They were beaten also. And it says, laid many stripes, whipped whipped and beaten for preaching the gospel, for confronting this young damsel in the devil. You know, you can do well and still pay for it. You know that, don't you? Doing the right thing does not ensure in every case, the immediate blessings of God. We can illustrate that many ways. Uh, let's start with John the Baptist. John the Baptist was doing the right things, and he lost his, his head over it. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He never sinned, and yet he was crucified. Stephen, Acts chapter 7, he was stoned for sharing a legitimate history of the Jewish people and bringing it to a logical conclusion that Jesus Christ was the person that all of these Old Testament individuals, fathers of their faith, were looking uh, forward to in the future. And he lost his life over it. Well, Paul and Silas end up being thrown in the slammer. They're beaten. They're whipped for it. So we can never, we can never feel like God has abandoned us because we're persecuted or because we pay a penalty for being faithful to the Lord. Don't ever feel that way. They laid upon them many stripes. It says that they put their feet, verse 24, fast in the stocks, verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. 
And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Wow! And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. I'm toast, man. <laughs> I've lost my prisoners. They've escaped, and I am going to pay the penalty for not keeping them. He would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are here. Then he called for a light and sprang. It must have been pretty dark in there. This is a prison. This isn't a modern-day prison. It was pitch black, cold, damp, who knows, rat-infested, who knows what it was. But he calls for a light. Do thyself no harm. We're all here. He calls for a light, sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that is a good question right there. Now if you want to go to a passage, and I've already counseled you not to go to any one passage to get or to, to make a formula for salvation. Go back to the lesson, what must I believe to believe? But if there's a place to go in the Bible to ask a good question and look for the answer to that question, this would be one of the primary passages that I would look to. The question is a sincere, straightforward question. What must I do to be saved? The answer follows in verse 31. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in the house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, his house, straightway. Straightway means immediately. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Again, we don't see a salvation formula, but this fellow believed in God, verse 34. He was baptized, based on other precedent, following a decision that he had made to trust Christ as Savior. He did that because verse 32 says that he heard the word of the Lord. And verse 31, he was told that he was to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lord He's the Lord God of heaven and earth. He is Jesus. He's the, the Savior of mankind. And He is the Christ. He's the Anointed One. The One who had been promised by God. All the way back into Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. He would be the One. He would be the One that would rescue man from his sin. Many things to comment upon here. He sang praises unto God, or they sang praises unto God. Um, music is important. Singing praises to God, I think it is important. Uh, there's a lot of, and I'm not saying this is immoral, but there's a lot of cheap, superficial Christian music on the market today. I'm not the person to be the, I judge personally for me, I'm not judging for you. If you're listening to something, you're blessed by it. God bless you. I'm glad you are. Good for you. Good for you. But I'm not blessed by everything I listen to. Some of the songs are very extremely repetitive. They're extremely simple musically. And they're very superficial in the message. Sometimes sometime songs that are supposed Christian music, they may not even mention God or Jesus by name. You have to kind of infer that by listening to what's said about the main characters of this, uh, in the song. So now I do like old hymns. I like old hymns because I was brought up on them. Uh, I like old hymns because oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes there's a great message. But I do think there's a lot of good 
contemporary, well thought out contemporary music. And I love to listen to that. I love to praise the Lord. I love to listen to people praise the Lord. It could be an old time uh, hymn that's 300 years old. It could be something that was written 15 or 20 or 60 years ago. It could have been written last week. If it's got some substance, it's got a message. If I can get the message and hear the message, you know, the message supersedes the music, not vice versa. Sometimes the music is so loud, I don't know what the people are saying. It's hard to get blessed when you can't hear what the message is. But then again, there's a lot of stuff that's cheap. I, McDonald's praise music. By the way, I'll go to McDonald's. I want you to know that. I will go to McDonald's occasionally. Occasionally. But it certainly isn't my first choice. I can guarantee you that. Every now and then I get a hankering for one of them cheap, <laughs> cheap, uh, superficial, contemporary songs, occasionally. And then I get to the point after listening to it and I say, enough. It's kind of like eating McDonald's cheeseburgers. You know, you put one down, yeah, okay. You get into that second one there and all of a sudden you realize what you're eating. And you, the third one, you throw it in the garbage can. Anyway, personal story, personal illustration. You can eat all the cheeseburgers you want if you help yourself. It's all right with me. All right, let's pick this thing up. An earthquake takes place. An earthquake takes place. We see that. And uh, all of the prison doors are opened. And uh, <laughs> the jailer, he thinks he's done. He's cooked. He knows what the consequences are of not fulfilling his responsibility. Well, he would have killed himself but Paul and apparently the rest of the, the prisoners in there, they don't take off. They don't leave. And Paul says, hold it, don't harm yourself. And this gets this fellow's attention. They've been singing. What must I do to be saved? Apparently he's familiar with the message that Paul and Silas have been preaching. Verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants saying, let those men, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, not so fast, Turkey, not so fast. They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily or privately they don't want anyone to know nay not gonna happen but let them come themselves and fetch us out we'll sit down and wait for your you know your highfalutin sergeant guys out there the leaders to come these are the guys and their henchmen have thrown us in here we want an explanation we want an explanation well, anyway, um, we pick this up in uh, verse number 38. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. Uh-oh, we have done something unforgivable and illegal. We're going to be the prisoners. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. They treated them with kid gloves and said, you know, <laughs> we're so, we apologize. We just didn't know who you were. We were kind of, <laughs> we're so sorry. Can, is there anything we can do for you? You know what? It'd be great if you, we want, we want you to go ahead and leave. We, you weren't going to stay here anyway, were you? Uh, uh, we just gave you, consider this. We gave you a place to stay last night, okay? And now you can be on your way. Bye. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia and when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Well, on page 203, we can apply some of what we've read. One of the things that really impresses me about this story is the fact that the missionaries encounter many different scenarios, but they are focused and they are obedient. They, they, I see the constancy and faithfulness of God in spite of the obstacles, 
I see that the gospel is breaking through regardless of the opposition. And again, we have been warned when we take the gospel public, as we said a few moments ago, we're going to be met with persecution and tribulation. We've given you a couple New Testament passages again that promise that that's part, it's part of the package of being a Christian. Note how the conversions of Lydia and the Philippian jailer differ. One is gently led to Christ through worship, prayer and praise, the jailer by example, and fear. The gospel casts a wide net. Again, there isn't one passage in the book of Acts that we can go to and say, you need to do it this way, you need to do it that way, you need to do it here. What must I believe to believe? Go back and check that lesson out. And you can pick things out of the book of Acts and see the essentials of trusting Christ as Savior. The chapter is encouraging. The trials, the disappointments, the challenges, and tribulations of life all come to pass. But God is faithful, and he never loses track of us. Circumstances have no diminishing or negative effect on God's faithfulness. Obedience, however, does not ensure smooth sailing does it. Paul's dealings with Timothy and requiring him to be circumcised illustrate that he had become all things to all men that he might save some. As a missionary, he was sensitive to cultural expectations and traditions. That's important. I mean, I'm just mentioning that, but you could, you could spend 30 minutes just talking about that one subject. I am not nearly as equipped or as experienced to talk about it like other people, like uh, my pastor, Kevin Pesky, uh, Bobby Bonner, people like that, Mike Ireland, some great missionaries that I know myself could do an excellent job on that uh, ver uh, statement. As a missionary, he, Paul, was sensitive to cultural expectations and traditions. They could give you many, many illustrations. Again, I'm reminded of the simplicity of the gospel message. So, we've come down through 16 chapters of the book of Acts. There are 28, 16 down, 12 more to go. So we're well past the halfway point. Again, we see the transitions, transitions from the uh, focus on the nation of Israel to the Gentile. And we really see that now as we get into these latter chapters of the book of Acts. In just a moment, we'll take a break, and we're going to look at the 17th chapter. And I entitled this, when I preached this originally and taught this originally, I entitled this, The American Dream or the American Nightmare. And we'll look at chapter number 17. We're going to go to Mars Hill. We're going to look at Paul's approach to dealing with Gentile intellects. Peter has dealt with Jews, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3. We've seen Peter deal with Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11. Paul is then commissioned to his missionary trips, and he's going around to all, many, many cities on his first, chapters 13 and 14, then chapter 15 on his second missionary trip, and on this second missionary trip, he goes to Athens, the capital city of Greece, and he is confronted by a group of people who are worshiping the unknown God. And what Paul does is he, in an ingenious way, he strikes up a conversation with them to present to them the Lord and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll come back to that in just a few moments.